Hi, this is Ned Siegfried from Siegfried & Jensen. As proud sponsors of BeliefCast, we hope you are inspired by Todd's weekly podcasts, which contain so many courageous stories of recovery and personal growth. Remember, it's not what happened in the past that matters, it's what happens in the future. We invite you all to work hard and be optimistic about your future. Enjoy today's podcast. Welcome back, everybody. This is Todd Sylvester with the Todd Inspires Belief Cast. Once again, as always, thank you for tuning in and believing in me and in this cause. We are we're making an impact on this world in such a way that I never thought possible when I first started doing this six years ago. And it's amazing where we're at today, you know, and so it's because of you guys for tuning in week after week. So thank you so much. And very fortunate that I have these amazing people come on my podcast. And today's going to be no different. And I know I say that a lot as well, but man, I'm telling you, there's so many people are just amazing, period. <laughs> and today we're joined by a gentleman named Kevin Baker. Kevin, thank you for uh, joining me today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Oh yeah, you sound great. Awesome. You know, awesome. Kevin, just quickly, just he, he goes around and he shares his unique story of, you know, coming back from failure, rising above expectations and living an amazing life and how it's all possible no matter what stands in your path. And this guy, I'll tell you, when you hear his story, it's going to, it's going to, you know, blow your mind. Honestly, you know, he was sent to prison for two con concurrent seven year sentences. He, you know, robbed a bank twice. He, you know, behind bars, man, he, he just, he, he was on full collapse. He was going to, you know, his life was done basically. And he's turned things around and I'm not, I could go into a bunch more, but I want, I want you guys to hear it from him. So Kevin, uh, man, I can't believe the turnaround you've done in your life. It's just remarkable. Um, I guess. Yeah. To, to me, what's remarkable <laughs> the most, um, and what's gotten me here, honestly, is the people in my life. Um, I've been through this whole roller coaster of, of the last 15 years of my life. Uh, it's some really amazing people, uh, starting with my family. Um, so before I get into any of my stuff, it's, I'm blessed to be alive. I'm blessed to be here. Um, I'm blessed to be with you today. And, um, thank you. And have made your acquaintance and your friendship, and quite frankly, now have the belief cast uh, as part of my life. You know, because you've had yeah. some amazing people on there, and you know, uh, I guess, uh, I guess you want kind of a little bit of what happened. Um, well, before uh, we get there, Kevin, and, and we definitely want to get there. Maybe, uh, maybe let's let our listeners know where did you grow up and tell us yeah. about your childhood. Yeah, well, I was going to go there first. I mean, I grew up uh, in Connecticut, uh, right outside of Hartford in a town called West Hartford, Connecticut, which, um, you know, it was, a, it was a middle class, maybe lower half of the middle class. My dad, you know, he busted his tail to try to do the best. My mom worked. Um, but we, you know, we were, I was a, a public park guy, you know, um, right. and it was, a, it was awesome. Uh you know, and back then in the seventies, it was a different world, you know, that when the sun came up, we left the house and the rule was be home when the streetlights come on. And we were, you know, gone for the day playing me and my buddies and sports or at the park or what have you. So it was, it was good. Um, I had, you know, I got into high school, my folks, uh, split when I was halfway through high school. And even that was, it was fine. We were all still friends. Um, my parents did an amazing job, even though they divorced of still both of them still coming to whatever family functions, Christmas, it wasn't two Christmases. It wasn't two. We all still got together and my extended right. family was amazing in that. So, you know, I grew up, you know, but I also taught, I mean, I grew up with, uh, a job. I was, you know, taught a work ethic young. I mean, I, kid around but it's the truth i i've been working since i was eight years old and i had two jobs when i was eight years old i had a paper wow. out in the morning and i had a paper out in the afternoon <laughs> and I, yeah and uh you know and uh, so i grew up like that i i uh after high school um 
just with some financial situation, we had to put off college. I had to basically go to work and help my dad uh, pay the bills. And, you know, I basically graduated high school paying a mortgage. Uh, my dad had kind of fallen a little bit apart and fallen a little behind. And um, I kind of took over in the as the parental role in our relationship. Um, but I eventually got back and went to college uh, a year and a half later, went to the University of Connecticut. Uh, just as they were starting to become a national powerhouse in both men's and women's basketball. We were there for the genesis of it. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And then, you know, I got out of college wanting to be a teacher, but there were many teaching jobs back then. And a friend of mine was in financial services and he said, Hey, come down here and sell these annuities. I said, annuity, what the hell is an annuity? <laughs> yeah, what's so, that? <laughs> so I got into the, basically the financial planning, retirement income planning business. Um, and, uh, and it clicked, man. And uh, I was good at it. I was blessed to have some amazing bosses and mentors and companies. And by 27 years old, I had become a field wholesaler, which is, um, you start making well into six figures. So yeah. I was blessed. Um, I worked hard, but I also had amazing companies and amazing people and amazing bosses, but success came quick, man. And I mean, by the time I was 30, I was driving a Mercedes and had moved from Boston back to my hometown, uh, bought a nice big house and was, was killing it. Uh, married my, married my bride and we started having more kids, joined the country club, making a half a million dollars a year it couldn't have been a better outcome for a young middle-class Kennedy park Hartford kid. If you, <laughs> if Norman yeah. Rockwell were to paint it and uh, you know, but what was, what was started underlying my life. Um, I played basketball my whole life and soccer oh, okay. and I, and I had beaten the hell out of my body. Yeah. Excuse me. And I kept playing basketball well into my 20s, rec leagues and such. And by the time I was 27, uh, I had basically uh, rearranged my lower spine, uh, to put it mildly. And oh, I be, yeah, and I was playing ball outside of uh, Boston at a rec league one night. And I remember running down the floor, fast break, guy went to pass to me. I turned kind of back toward him to get it, and my entire body locked. And my back said, my back said, all right, dude, that's enough. We're tired. Um, it took me about two years. And in December of 1999, I had my first, uh, spinal reconstructive surgery oh, wow. and, um, had my lower spine rebuilt. I had screws inserted into my sacrum and into my lowest lumbar vertebrae L5, uh, rods were inserted to connect these screws and a paste was put around them to basically fuse. It was a reconstructive and then fusion surgery. And that was my first introduction uh, to narcotic pain meds, which is yeah. you know, where a lot of the, where a lot of this story starts to turn yeah. a little bit. Um, well, yeah, that, that, yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, your life's going so well. You've got everything <laughs> going for you. Then you have this injury introduced to yeah. opiates and, yeah, but yeah. and and back then, I mean, I was I I I played hard. Um, I was in an industry that played hard, and by that I mean a lot of alcohol, a lot of conferences. You're going mm -hmm. to these wonderful yeah. locations, and but the rules back then were simple. You might be out till four in the morning with probably your boss, but you better be in the breakout room at eight a.m. And we mm -hmm. always were make the bell. So it was a work hard, play hard, and booze was yeah. a big part of it, and. You know, I was part of that whole lifestyle and I had some other things. I smoked uh, pot back then. Um, and then, like I said, I got to, uh, pain medications from the first surgeon. But back then it was Percocet yeah. and it wasn't a high dose. And for the next five, six, seven years, the pain was still there. I took the Percocets. And if I had a script for, say, 30 days, on the average month, I might run out in day 28. You know, they, yeah. you know, I took an extra one here and there, but they weren't a problem is my point. Okay. You get in about eight years after that surgery and my back is starting to really, uh, uh, the pain was starting to get 
incredibly more and more. Um, so I knew some more stuff was going on. It was like I had come to terms with the original pain, but now I had a new pain. So I started looking at having uh, a second surgery. And about, I don't know, about eight years after my first, I met a guy and he was actually a client. And he had been diagnosed with MS. Oh. And this is a guy who was a flat out, if you saw him, he was a stud. He could have been a model in any magazine. He was 6'4", beautiful, played basketball uh, at Dartmouth, which tells you two things. Number one, he was a great athlete. Number two, he's very smart. But Greg introduced me to my first oxy, oxy pill. Um, mm. so the irony is after all my surgeries, my first meeting with what ripped my life to pieces was not actually from the surgeons. Um, it was from a, a colleague, if you will. He said, Hey, try one of these. And I was, I literally, I was reticent. I put it in my pocket and I don't know, two weeks later, I still had it. I said, you know what? One day I put it in my mouth and I swallowed it. And that was the day life went from again you know a super lucky blessed life to starting to turn um my whole body lit up and every addict uh an opiate addict whether it's pills or or other heroin that i've met and talked to in the meetings and everywhere else yeah. we all have the same story todd which is For that sure. first time that first time was life altering and it was euphoric and the angels sung and the, yeah. every, every cell <laughs> yeah. twinkled. And, um, and it was, it was, all, it was game on. Um, this guy and I continued to kind of get together once a month and we, he'd share some pills with me and it slowly became evident to me that I really liked these. Um, right. I got into another surgical group to have my second spinal reconstruction and i had them actually after my surgery prescribe me the oxys which they were all too happy to do back then yeah right um and i realized that i really you know started to like these things more and more and it was no more like a script would last 90 percent of the uh duration you know the script would last 40 percent, and i was out yeah um i started to uh find different ways um to find the pills through this guy in up in boston i'd end up buying them because he was buying them from him a little bit here and there to supplement what the surgeons were giving me um i also found a way to uh basically forge the prescription that i was getting from the surgeons um Back then, this surgical office, for whatever reason, didn't have the traditional uh, prescription pads. They actually printed out your prescription on a regular eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And then the doctor would sign it and it flew. So you can see how easy it would be for somebody to manipulate those. Um, and I started forging scripts, which was you know, wow. probably the first time I really started letting the addiction steer me and you talked about the bully and you talk about the yeah. bully and I started getting bullied by my addiction and it started taking me bad places. Did I your family, did your family, Kevin, know that you were at this place, you know, struggling um, at this point? After about a year, um, okay. uh, from meeting, uh, uh, this gentleman and starting to do the pills, I did realize it. And I did confess to my wife one day, I, I sat down on the couch and I said, listen, I'm getting addicted to these things and she was 100 percent uh amazing and supportive and yeah we got i got myself into a uh program where uh it was a group program once a week and they would treat us with suboxone which was an anti-opiate yeah. and help me get get clean and i did but as many of us do todd it the bully you know didn't yeah. go quietly yeah. so six months of good and then he would show back up and I would slip again. And this went on and on. And uh, the further it went and the more pills I needed on a daily basis, um, the lies. And like you said, the bully lies, man. And yeah. the lies came out. So my my wife and uh, and my extension, every friend I've I've ever had, nobody knew that. Um, 
I was doing the amount of pills I was doing. Nobody knew I was doing these pills other than, yeah, you know, he's had back surgeries. He pops a pill every once in a while. They didn't know I was now snorting, uh, which became my delivery method. Um, you crush them and you snort them. I was now snorting uh, a dozen pills a day, and that continued to ramp up. Um, when the forging game ran out, I started buying them. Um, and when you start doing 20 pills a day at $30 a pop, yeah, you can start to see, Todd, how when I left the corporate side in the end of 2012, worth about $2.5 million, um, between some bad business dealings uh, that happened mostly because my head wasn't in them because addiction had taken over. They weren't, I didn't, I got, I got a little uh, screwed over. Isn't the right word. I got left by some business partners that they could have done, you know, a far better job ethically, but I can't put all the blame there because my head wasn't in the game. The, the bully had taken over. So I know if my head was completely in the game, my venture into building my own practice would have gone a lot differently and a lot better. Right. But the long and the short of it is uh, 2012, I left the corporate side. 2015, I was sitting in an office in Hartford, Connecticut, applying for food stamps for my family because between the business failing and losing a few hundred thousand dollars there and spending you know, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a day on my habit, walking into my bank every few days and withdrawing six, seven thousand dollars in cash and telling the bank tellers I had started rehabbing houses and the people who worked for me only wanted to be paid in cash. So that's why I was taken out. You know, I had to lie for everything, right? Wow. As we do. Um, yeah, right. And, and none of my friends knew, and there wasn't a uh, facility, you know, if I went out to dinner, I, I knew immediately where the best bathroom was to go in there, find privacy, crush a pill. If we went to a sporting event, I knew the bet, you know, and that became my life, man. Um, wow. Yeah. And so, you know, like I said, by the end of 2015, I had gone from a dream life to, uh, borrowing money from friends and family um, blaming all the financial need, if you will, on the business losses. So I had a cover for that. Right. Right. Um, all, all my financial hardship was not me. It was because I got screwed over back then by these business guys. So I had cover for my wife who knew we right. were, we quit the country club and she obviously could tell that financially we were no longer in position, but understood that it was because of these business losses. I, didn't let her on that I was, you know, spending six, seven, eight thousand dollars a week. Um, Jeez. And wow. with the mortgage company starting to call because I'd started missing payments and other bills, including owning, owing a drug dealer um, uh, several thousand dollars. Um, one morning, and this came without warning to me. It came without planning or plotting it out or casing the joint, as they would say. One morning, I woke up in January of 2016 and said, we need some money. You're going to get foreclosed and you got these guys calling you. And next thing I knew, Ted, I was walking into a bank uh, with a knife, all masked up, all masked up and ran out of the bank with $15,000, got in my car and drove off. What, um, um, I know this is, you know, kind of a loaded question, but when you were, after you had left the bank, were you like going, I can't believe I just did that. No, I didn't. Um, okay. I was so, yeah, the bully, you know, to keep yeah. using your, um, I left the bank, got on the highway and hightailed it to meet, a, a dealer who was going to give me more pills. Oh, I, goodness. Wow. It didn't really sink in. I was in, listen, you, you go back, a, going back a few months before that bank robbery, um, uh, the summer before when things, you know, when I literally stopped paying bills and I was in a world where um, 
I thought on a daily basis how to kill myself. I was there. I oh. wondered about, you know, getting going in the garage and getting in the car. But then it would come back. I said, I can't do that. You know, Katie and the girls come home. That's not something you want to see your children to see. Um, we lived in a house out by the woods. I said, oh, it's winter. I can walk out in the woods and just fall asleep in the cold and die. I mean, this was my daily living was to snort pills and think about killing myself day after day. Um, mm -hmm. And so running into that bank, like I said, it wasn't planned. Um, it went so well. I am ashamed to say that two weeks later, I ran into the exact same bank and put these poor women through a second trauma in under two weeks. Oh my goodness. Um, and it's a shame of my life. I have four daughters. Yeah. Uh, the reason I went to that bank um, on that particular morning is because I knew once that bully or whoever it was said, let's go rob a bank. Yeah. I knew, I knew that that was the bank because it's a small country setting and there were only four little women who worked in there. There was no mail. There was no security. I knew this because I had been doing my father's banking on his behalf because he was in and out of, uh, a nursing home and I had power of attorney. So I knew the bank, I knew the women, I sat with them and yet I still masked up and twice put them through hell. Um, after the second robbery, it did not go as well as the first. I was spotted. My car was identified. I got chased through about uh, 10 different Connecticut towns as well as into Massachusetts at one point. Wow. On back, back country roads going 85 miles an hour, blowing by school buses, blowing by people, putting everybody's life in jeopardy. They locked the town down uh, where the bank was uh, and somehow uh, outmaneuvered them all and made it home. Um, no way. And to go back to your question uh, after the first robbery, the second one, when I got home, I was shaking. And my wife said, what's what's wrong you know i said oh nothing nothing i was i was in shock it yeah. that's when it that's when it really did hit me what had you know what i had allowed my life to become and i sat there visibly shaking and your wife guess like, what? has no clue yeah. no you just robbed a bank for the second time no and wow. And about 20 minutes later, I got in my car and guess where I went? I went to meet another dealer and give her money and get more pills. Jeez. And were you, you know, thinking, like said, were you thinking, uh, were you thinking at this point they were chasing you? So they probably have a make on you and they're going to come yeah. get you. Yeah. There was a lot going on that I knew I was, I yeah. was, uh, I was hit. So that was a Monday. By Saturday, they had called, uh, somehow got a hold of my wife. I was out uh, on that Saturday again, meeting a dealer, uh, the prevailing theme, right? Yeah. And they had told my wife what was going on. And by then, she had kind of put it together with some pictures that came out on Patch and some other stuff. So they basically told her on that Saturday afternoon, we're coming for your husband tonight, you know, get the girls and get out of the house and which she did. And I got back that Saturday and they uh, pulled me out of the house at gunpoint. Um, oh man. Uh, basically they called on my cell phone and said, you know, this is the West Harford police, Mr. Baker, we got a call that you were in your house and you are suicidal and you have a knife. I said, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, we got, I said, no, no, I'm fine. I hung up and they called again. And again, I finally said, what? And he said, listen, Mr. Baker, I've got a, I've got an officer out in front of your house. Can you just go out front and give him a wave? We're just doing a wellness check to make sure you're okay. And once I stepped out of the house to give him a wave, I realized there were uh, four automatic weapons perched on the side of my driveway with four state troopers pointed at me. Um, oh, they man. came out of the woods, the dogs were barking, they were yelling again on my knees. It was a scene right from the movies, uh, absent the helicopter. I didn't warrant right. a helicopter, I guess, but yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so they sat with me that night while they got the warrant and on Sunday morning, February 14th, think about that day. Yeah. Um, in 2016, I was arrested on Valentine's day. Jeez. Um, and as I look back um, and 
as I started finding the light after a while, I've come to realize, Todd, that February 14th, 2016 was not the worst day of my life. It was, in fact, the day that the Connecticut State Police saved my life. Um, mm. Had I not been arrested, I know for a fact, I know for a fact that by April 1st, I would have been dead. I would have either finally had succumbed to the daily voice of taking my own life or I would have overdosed. This was right when fentanyl was just starting to appear. Yeah. Um, or I would have overdosed another way, or I would have crashed and rolled my truck again, racing somewhere to meet a dealer. I would have been dead by April 1st had they not saved my life that, that February 14th. Wow. Uh, yeah. yeah, I got, I was arrested uh, first week in there detoxing in a prison cell. Um, the darkness came again and I will tell you that um, in a Hartford, Connecticut County jail cell in the suicide watch um, arm, if you will, or block what you have where they had me. Yeah. Um, the only reason I'm here to talk to you today again, because I did fail and I did give up. I had the sheet tied around one end, which was my neck, oh. but in the suicide watch cell, there was nowhere to tie the other end. And that's a big part of why I'm still here. Jeez. I remember. Yeah. I remember thinking, all right, if we can't do this, can I climb on top of this little, you know, toilet sink apparatus and jump head first. And if I hit my head hard enough on the concrete floor, will that be enough to end life? And uh, these are the thoughts that were going through my head the first 48 hours after my arrest. I can um, I can only imagine. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And then uh, just um, a few days later, I finally got my first call with my family and my wife got on the phone, the most amazing and strong person I've ever known. And her and my daughters. Um, yeah. I mean, I, with love beyond measure, they saved my life yet again, because my wife knew where I was mentally. Yeah. And she said, listen, listen, you've got to fight. You've got these girls. You've got these girls who are going to need you. You've got to fight. And, uh, and that phone call, you know, was another time that I, my life was saved, um, man by others. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, our then 12 year old got on the phone and okay. she immediately said, daddy, I love you. I forgive you. I know you're going to be good. And that was a lift. And then our five year old got on the phone and it's the yin and yang. And in, only the way an innocent five-year-old could ask uh, came the dagger. And she says, Daddy, did you know that you were taking other people's money? It's, oh, man. Yeah, man. That <laughs> one, that one, that one hurt. And, and as it should. Um, so anyways, uh, I was, I was put through kind of the Connecticut prison system, um, evaluated, finally determined I was no longer a risk to myself and, uh, began what became, as you said, the beginning of two seven year prison sentences. Um, they were concurrent. I got two years for each. I pled out. I pled guilty from the beginning, um, yeah. the first meeting I had with the attorney, I said, I don't want anything other than to take responsibility for this. Um, you know, and he naturally said, well, we can look at the warrant. And, look, and I said, listen, man, I did this. I own it. Let's. Well, that, that's pretty rare, Kevin, to hear someone say, you know what? I'm just going to own it. That's pretty amazing. I, I, I guess I just, I, I had to, I mean, yeah. I owned it. You know, I did. Um, wow. So that's where I was, you know, and about 18 months later, I started, I, I started coming back, if you will. It took me a good 18 months, though, of castigating yeah. myself and beating mm -hmm. the hell out of myself emotionally and mentally. Um, I also had to go through a process of uh, assimilating myself because a middle-aged 
college educated white guy in a state prison, especially where I was, I was put into the supermax facility at first, mm. you know, you kind of stand out. Um, and I fortunately had some, some guys immediately kind of mentor me. It's kind of like that cliche of a guy going to jail and finding a mentor, you know? Yeah. But I had some guys basically say, listen, dude, this is, this is how you gotta play it. Um, and so I had to kind of abandon the guy that I was driving a Mercedes and going to Fenway park and staying in a suite and become basically what my crimes were, which was a, a violent bank robber. Um, mm. you know, and yeah. so uh, eventually I started through again, people, my family, uh, my father and I had an amazing relationship where he, he became my dad again, which was, like one of the blessings I take out of this is for, you know, when I got arrested after being the father in our relationship, since I was 16, he now became my dad again. And he visited me every week when he could and was, you know, always saying, listen, man, I'm proud of you. We're going to get through this. Um, uh, along with my oldest daughter, Sydney, she was a rock for me from day one. Wow. She, uh, was there for me mentally, emotionally, without judgment. And I had some friends and I had some people that I had barely known maybe in passing that wrote me letters, some saying, thank you. Um, I was getting addicted to the pain meds or I'm addicted to Xanax or I'm an alcoholic and seeing what happened to you. Thank you. Cause it's given me pause. So I got some of those letters, which was, an amazing gift just to, you know, again, it's perspective, Todd, and I could either let this thing ruin me or I could start to let this thing strengthen me and come out of the other end better for it. Um, yeah. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, I got a ton of questions for you. <laughs> yeah. That's, I, I it. Mean, that's, uh, that's an amazing story, but, but I know there's more to your story because all the good you're doing now, but I just have a, and I know this is also a tough question. I'm sure. Is there is there a lesson that you learned in prison that stands out above the rest? I was is there something that like, man, this is what I learned in that six years that uh, you know that really made an impact. I, I know you have many lessons, but is there one that yeah. stands out? Um, the resiliency of the human spirit. Ooh, yeah. Um, and I talk about that in my speech. Uh, one of my speeches. Um, is I learned that the human spirit, and I'm not talking just me specifically, I'm talking in general, it is inherent in each and every one of us. I know this. Regardless of the situation, regardless of the obstacles, I firmly do believe through my own experience, through the experience of my family, because they had to have resiliency. Right. Um, and through the experience of, I, I, I dedicated the last, uh, uh, four and a half years of my, uh, prison to reading and learning and looking for stories. And I came across so many amazing people who had overcome obstacles. And so that's the biggest thing I think I came out is the fact that regardless of what's going on, you, your spirit whether it's a small thing, whether it's a, you know, I got to divorce my spouse or I got to deal with my child who's in trouble, whatever it is, Todd, we right. can get through it. The, that each and every one of us with help, I couldn't right. get here, as I said at the beginning, without help. And it's not that we're all resilient warriors who can get through anything on our own. It's that we're all resilient yeah. And with the help right. of, of people who care, we can listen, man, if I could come back from wanting to kill myself in a suicide watch cell, detoxing, drinking water out of the toilet in, in, oh. in County, because the guards thought it'd be funny to put their quote unquote, rich white guy in the cell where the water didn't work. So oh I'm gosh. detoxing. They did not give me treatment for um, the detoxing, which I found out that several others through prison are like, they didn't help you. You know, they didn't give you some box. No, nope. they let me sit there and just basically suffer. just throw up and shit and suffer. Um, 
So if I can come back from that, yeah, um, people can come back. And again, people have it worse, and unfortunately, you know. But I, yeah, you're gonna come through. You're gonna be bloody. You're gonna be beaten. Yeah. But it, it, the one thing I've learned, Todd, is that people can come back. Wow. You know, I love that. Um, yeah. So that's beautiful. That's a beautiful message. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, Kevin, I know now you are a messenger of all this, you know, the things you've already shared with us, but you know, you present now, you love speaking, you love helping other people talk, talk to us a little bit about what that looks like and kind of what your overall, I guess, mission is now in life. All right. Um, well, when I was in the financial business, um, I was a wholesaler, which a large part of my job was to convince uh, advisors to sell their clients, the products that I work for, you know, like I work for MetLife. Um, right. And a lot of that is public speaking. You know, I'd get up and stand in front of whether yeah. it be 20 advisors or 200 and give, give them talks about the MetLife products or the Sun America when I was there. Um, so public speaking was always kind of natural to me. Um, you know, I know that most of the human species it's it's a fear greater than getting attacked by a shark or even death but for me it came natural so about two years into my stay a young woman who i we've always considered to be my fifth daughter or fifth daughter she worked for me early on in my career okay and she came to see me and we set up a special visit she flew up to connecticut spent the day with katie and the girls because they were close and then came to see me the next day in prison and she says heavy you're a train wreck and people will pay to see a train wreck so get it together start writing speeches and that's what you're gonna do and um it kind of gave me permission todd to what i had already begun thinking would be my way back in terms of making a living and trying yeah. to help katie put these girls through school but the bigger or just as equally important is it's cliche, but if I can speak to a room full of people and one person comes up to me afterwards and says, man, you've given me a lot to think about in terms of my own behavior, my own life and my own addiction or my own bully, then it's wow. worth it, man. I mean, yeah. what could be better than to, <laughs> right. uh, you know, I need to make a living. I, I, I need to earn money to help my wife and these girls and you know um, i mean they lost you know they lost a lifestyle you know they were being raised as country club kids right um and all that went away and yet they're still in my corner um and now the goal is just to put these girls through college and help my wife do that if i can do that and make an impact um then i'm truly blessed man i'll 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 die a happy person, you know? Um, so yeah, it's it, the message that I give is it, it's about addiction and it's about, you know, in, in your terms, the bully and what I allowed to happen, but it's yeah. about the human spirit and it's about how uniquely beautiful each and every one of us are. Um, yeah. one of the things that came across in my struggles to find my humanity again, you know, and come back from, being the bankrupt, you know, um, yeah. I came to realize, you know, how cool each and every human being really is when you think about it, because yeah. uh, there have been about 117 billion humans to have come and gone so far. Mm -hmm. And yet you are the only Todd Sylvester that is you. Yeah. Uh, so the odds are one in 117 billion. So <laughs> Part of my message is wake up, man, every day and be happy. You won the lottery. You you had a one in 117 billion chance and you got it. You yeah. are you. So I talk about that and I talk about Love it. Uh, I yeah. lost 2,173 days to my addiction in prison. And quite frankly, far more than that because I was far gone. Yeah. As you right. know, well before my arrest, For I was sure. I yeah. was mentally gone and checked out of my family's life years before. But my prison sentence, I ended up 2173 days. So part of that is realizing how finite, as special as each of us are, we're only here for 
but a glimpse, you know? And so I try to remind people that, listen, those things that you've got on your bucket list, get going because before you know it, yeah, you know, before you know it, it's gone. It's done. Um, yeah. It's done. And, yeah. and then just the, the kind of the third message I try to boil into it all is what we were talking about before, which is the resiliency of each of us and uh, the ability to overcome, uh, you know, obstacles. Uh, I believe that as long as there is breath in your lungs and blood pumping in your heart, there is nothing that you can't overcome. Um, And I do believe it. And I was given grace uh, by having the state police arrest me on February 14th. I was given grace by having Katie and my girls tell me fight. I was given grace by my father and by my daughter, Sydney. Yeah. Um, So my life was saved and I have who knows how many days left, but whatever they, whatever that number ends up being, I want them to count, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I owe, I owe so many, so much. I owe society so much. Yeah. Um, I do. I, I mean, I, I owe the state of Connecticut, $45,000 $45,000 a year for six years. Cause that's what it costs to incarcerate me. Mm-hmm. I owe, you know, the people who I hurt, I owe the police officers whose lives I put in danger. I owe the women at the bank. I have a, a huge debt to pay and I plan on trying for the life of me to do it, man. Yeah. Wow. Man. I, it's amazing. Your attitude, Kevin, I I'm really impressed. Just, and I know you don't look at it that way. You're, you're just doing what you know is right now. And, and it just, but it's really impressive that you've, you know, at the brink of wanting to jump off the the toilet in prison in your cell to try to hopefully end your life. But here you are now, you know, yeah. you're, you're giving back and you're trying to make amends with the, the, the community and the people in your, uh, that you live by. And it's just, it really is am- amazing to, and I, one of the things that really stood out, Kevin, is when you said people can come back. I, I think yeah. that what a great message for this is, I mean, that's a good, that's actually a good title for what we're talking about here is, you know what, right. wherever you're at, you can come back. Kevin is living proof of that. Yeah. And look, the, there, there are people in your life that their opinion matters. And there are people that, you know, might have an opinion about you and how you're living and they shouldn't, it shouldn't matter to you. The people in my life, meaning my family and my closest friends, are all been not only amazingly supportive, but they've shown radical forgiveness. Yeah. Um, There are people, Todd, who um, you know, who don't want anything to do with me, and I understand and I respect their decision. Yeah. But as long as you know, you can come back, and as long as the the there's the kind of the people under your tent, that's all that matters, man. Yeah. You know, in the end, in the end. Now I have a bigger, you know, almost, I don't, I don't want to say spiritual, but I have a bigger mission, which is, as I said, to kind of, you know, get the red off my ledger. And again, if, you know, I did one speech back in December and, and a gentleman who actually I had, he had coached me when I was a kid playing soccer Mm. And all these years later, he walks into this room where I'm about to present. And he says, what are you doing here? Do you work here? I said, oh, you don't. I said, you don't. They haven't. Because he's actually kind of like a satellite. He's not in the, the office 24. Yeah. Or, uh, and I said, oh, you don't know what's about to go on here, do you? He goes, no. <laughs> and so I gave my presentation mm. and he came up to me afterwards and was bawling. And oh. I started crying. And. One of my daughters had come with me to film it um, and she's looking at us and she's crying. I mean, and it, and he just was full of gratitude and, and pride and it, it's, it's a moment I will never forget. And it's, you know, some other people have come back to me after I've talked and said, thank you. And like I said, I got letters. And, yeah. Um, that's, it's, corny maybe to some people it's cliche but again Todd if I can 
help put these girls through college and help, you know, pay back society in some small way. Um, I'm, I'm good, you know, You're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And I know it does sound cliche, but it's the truth. If you, cause if you save one person, think about what they're going to go do with that. And then they're, they're going to touch someone's life. And then it just kind of yeah. snowballs and there's that ripple yeah. effect, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, yeah. it's, it can be exponential growth. Um, yeah. wow. you know, and I talk, I talk, when I talk, I talk about, uh, a concept I've learned through DBT uh, therapy, um, which is radical acceptance. Yep. And I, you know, I had to radically accept what my life had become and what my life is. Yeah. You know, my life is now a convicted felon. Um, and according to the state, a, a convicted dangerous felon. It was a violent uh, crime in, in that I didn't hurt anybody, but that I carried a knife, which is, you know, so I needed to radically accept that. And right. the people in my life have radically accepted me. Um, and they're pushing me and they're behind me and dozens of friends from the industry are all about trying to get me hired to speak at their companies. Um, I've just done a call today with a, guy I went to high school with and I've known my whole career we're going to say and he's bringing me in to speak to his company and it's uh like I said at the beginning man I I uh I'm blessed that I have such people in my life you know Absolutely. but the, the forgiveness and and I you know and the biggest theme if you will of my speech is all about perspective and yeah. looking at looking at life now differently than I did before and having this gift given to me to pause and look at things from different angles um, and learn that with perspective, again, we can get through anything. Um, and again, it's not to say that there won't be sorrow, there won't be pain. Yeah. You know, it's not just wake up every day and Oh, they took my house, but that that's great. You know, that's not yeah. what I'm trying to right. get at. Yeah, man. Sure. It's going to hurt from time to time. Life is painful, but the, you know, the gift of perspective um, has been probably the biggest thing uh, with the resiliency and it all fits together, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, it's in, in small ways and in big, you know, I mean, yeah. I get stuck in traffic one night coming back from driving my daughter to college and I tell my buddy the next morning and I'm talking to him about, he's like, Oh, you must've been going bullshit. It's, you know, yeah. it's Sunday night. You're parked <laughs> yeah. on the highway on a Sunday night at 10 o'clock. I said, Mac, are you kidding me? I said, I'm sitting in this truck. Now, granted, it's a beat up old Jeep. It's not the Mercedes I once had. I'm sitting in this truck, listening to music that I like. Yeah. A year ago, I was sitting in prison, brother. Traffic yeah. is bliss. <laughs> Wow. And it's, you know, it, like I said, it's perspective. You can, you, you can always have it worse. There's always going to be somebody better off and there's always going to be somebody worse off and you got to just deal with what you got to deal with. You know? Yeah, for sure. Well, um, I have a question for you. If there, if there's yes, someone, sir. if there's someone listening to your voice right now, Kevin, who's in that dark place, they're struggling, they're not sure what to do. What, what would you tell that one person right now? Who's listening to you in that, in that space? There, and I believe this with every cell in my body, they might not. There are people in their life that if they ask for help, will help. Mm -hmm. You know, I lived um, for 15 years in private shame. You know, nobody knew my addiction was where it was. None of my, no, I didn't share it with anybody. And again, my wife early on, you know, knew that I was prone to it and had I not hidden it from her. And if it wasn't her, it would have been any one of a dozen other people in my life if I reached out. So right. no matter how alone you may feel and no matter how ashamed you may be, um, you know, the old Bible quote, knock and the door shall be in, you know, people will be there for you. And I, and I talk about this. It's funny you bring it up or 
or fortuitous because I talk about this exact point in, in my speech um, is that if you are in that place, whether it's a, a substance abuse problem, whether it's a domestic, whatever it is, whatever it is that is troubling you, there are people I guarantee that will help you if you ask. So have the courage, mm-hmm. which I wish I had more courage because I had people who would have stepped up even more and helped me get off that addiction train that I was on. Right. So, and, and I, and, and I say this and I mean it. Um, if you're listening to this and you do feel you're in a place where you need something, some help, some body, some, what, again, bad marriage, bad drug addict, whatever it is. If you are ashamed to talk to anybody in your life, I get it. I've been there. And thus, if that's the case, Todd, and I mean this sincerely, who's ever listening, reach out to me because I'll pick up the damn phone and we will spend as many minutes, hours and days talking as is needed because I owe. Wow. Well, that was going to be my next question actually is, if someone does want to reach out to you, Kevin, and mm-hmm. ask you a question or talk to you and, and then, you know, get, learn more about your presentations and things, what's the best way for them to do that? Probably the best is through uh, the website that, that we, we built, um, kevinbakerpresents.com. Okay. Um, all my contact info is on there. Uh, shoot me a message, shoot me an email. When I present, I you know, I say, listen, if you want my cell phone number, come up, I'll give that to you. Um, but probably yeah. the easiest way is just to go to Kevin Baker presents, which is a website that, uh, that we put together. It's got, you know, my material and clips and all that, uh, information and blogs that I've been writing and, uh, speeches and stuff and ways to hire me, ways to reach me. So, Again, I, I mean it, man. Um, I've been there. I was ashamed. I wish I had more strength to ask some of my friends for help. Um, and like I said, if you're in a place where you're in the same, reach out to me. It's a complete stranger. You don't have to feel, you right. know, I'm here. Like I said, it's, uh, I got, I got red on my ledger, man. I got it <laughs> and I got yeah. limited days left. We're only given yeah. so many days on this little blue marble. Yeah. You know? Wow. Well, that's beautiful. And, and yeah. yeah. And before I, you know, I, I would be remiss having, uh, not turned it back and said, you know, your belief cast and what I've seen in going in there and hearing your story, uh, is amazing and um the fact that you have made your life's mission to do good with what you've been through is uh is awesome and it's oh, and you. it's awe-inspiring and and it's a place that i hope someday i can get to in terms of the numbers of people that you reach todd with your message i think it's just amazing and oh, thank you Thank oh. you. That, that means the world to me, Kevin. And I'm, I'm, I can't thank you enough and how grateful I am that I now know you and that we can, we can be friends, even though we're on the opposite sides of the country. And, yep. uh, but yeah, it's great to just know you. And I, and I do believe you when you say you're there to help anybody, I, I, I can feel it in your words. And, and it's amazing. I I've noticed this a lot when people go through something really difficult and they get past it it's almost like a natural feeling to like, you know what? I now want to give back because I'm in such a good place and I want to help someone along the road. So I just love what you're doing, man. And I just, I'm so, I'm so impressed with you and everything you're doing, brother. Well, that's awesome. Coming from you. That's, that's makes my day, man. I don't, (laughs) you know, will carry me through many days to come. Awesome. Um, Awesome. Cause it's, it's the, the love and the respect and the uh, appreciation like I said, it's it's really cool to see you doing what you've been doing. And quite frankly, you have met, you know, uh, many others. You and I were talking about some mutual friends and how yeah. you and I came to. And what's really, really been cool over the last several months is meeting people like you. And I've met, you know, many. And it seems like you're all based somewhere in Utah, by the way, for some, there must be something out there, but I've met. Yeah, some we got amazing, some really good water out here. <laughs> exactly. I've met some amazing <laughs> people who have gone the road you and I have gone, have fought 
you know, demons, um, whether it be addiction or violence or what have you. And uh, it's, like I said, the human spirit is resilient and can do amazing things. And it's just cool to have met so many people who are doing those amazing things. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Well, I can't thank you enough for your time today. Your story is amazing. You're amazing. I just appreciate you sharing this with our listeners today. And, and, uh, we were just, yeah, we were all just blessed uh, to hear your story today. So Uh, I've been blessed to be with you, man. Thank you. You're welcome. And there you go, everyone. I told you today was going to be amazing. Kevin Baker, please check out his website, Kevin Baker presents and, uh, you know, reach out to him, ask him a question. He's obviously very willing and very open to helping anybody. So please reach out to him. And I can't wait for you guys to, to listen to this episode and share it with someone and especially someone, you know, that might be struggling and you're not sure how to break the ice with them, share the, share the link to this episode to kind of break the ice. And then you can follow up and ask them what they got out of it. And then maybe it, it, it puts on a conversation where they can get some help. So Thank you for believing in me. Thanks to my sponsors, Siegfried and Jensen, Wasatch Recovery, Thread Wallets, and the music that you listened to at the very beginning, at the very end of this, is by my good friend, the award-winning pianist Paul Cardall. He's an amazing man. So thank you for all that. And one last thank you to Kevin. Thank you for your time, brother. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. You betcha. Everyone, Till next time, man. <laughs>